Hey everybody.
I'll be right back. I need to feed the cat. All right, I'm back. Cat is fed. Oh, that's cool. When is the uh, uh, when is the expected date? Hmm. Well, hope everything goes well. Kittens are always uh, kittens are always really fun, exciting. Yeah, Professor, I think this is their this is our second litter actually. So we're planning to get her. Uh, I think it's spaded, right? When you they get neutral, like uh, so they won't have any more kittens. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, I think for for females it's called spade, and for for males it's called neuter. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I'm. I'm so I'm familiar with the terminology and all that stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a, a newborn. Like a, <laughs> it's like I mean, essentially, it's the same thing. So you know, it prevents your cat from having kids anymore. But I think yeah. the, the surgical procedure, I think, is, is different. Um, and I think there's there's different prices depending on depending on what it is too. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I'll go ahead. Oh uh, well, she was like a, she was an abandoned kitten, and uh -huh. uh, we kind of just picked her up, started feeding her, and pretty much made our our home her home and, uh, there's a lot of uh, alley cats here but um yeah she just chose here and we're like oh man like she's knocked up <laughs> we got <laughs> <laughs> so we had to find you know homes for the first litter it's like but luckily we get a lot of people wanted kittens so we just like got rid of them really quick nice that's good that's good we're like, we can't have so many kittens here like there's too many of them now like yeah yeah they're uh, definitely a, a lot to take care of. It's good you're able to find homes for all the uh, the first ones. Yeah, I think it's uh, because of the pandemic, everybody, you know, wanted some company, I think. So everybody yeah. has time. Oh, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm sure that's it. Yeah, definitely. Pets are pets are on the rise because it's, 
a good companion that you don't have to worry so much about getting COVID from. So that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. Okay, it's uh, 5.30, so let's uh, go ahead and get started today. Uh, so I, I have a lot of announcements today, so you know, um, you know, definitely want to get, get rolling. Uh, before, before we get into that, how's, how's everyone doing today? Good, Professor. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, week seven now. So I'm sure you guys have, you know, lots of uh, lots of midterms. And so, you know, I, I was telling my my previous class that, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not that far removed from from being a student. And so, you know, I remember how how bad it gets and you know, all the all the crazy nights and all the studying. And so, you know, and I, and I think just ever since I graduated, just it just keeps getting harder and harder for you guys because you know, there's just so much going on. Especially with the pandemic, and so you know, I just just um, just want to take a moment and just say that you know, um, you know, you guys have my respect. You know, I, I really you know, with how hard it is being a student nowadays, you know, it's it's it just gets crazy and crazier. But you guys, you know, you guys always you know put up with it. You guys, you know, always work really hard, and you know, I just want to say that I really respect that. Okay, and so today, um, you know, first thing I want to talk about is our upcoming midterm. So speaking of uh, speaking of working hard. <laughs> Um, you know, so I, I do want to take a, a, a moment to kind of discuss, you know, the format for, for the exam and, you know, what you can expect. Um, next, I, I, I finally, you know, um, gotten everything together for, for your final, uh, for your final, um, for your final project. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I want to talk about the specs for that, um, you know, what the requirements are um, and how you can sign up for a, for a model. And so I, I know I kind of talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but I finally, you know, sorted everything out, you know, I, I have the, uh, the folder and everything. And so, you know, I want to make sure I talk about that today. Um, and there's also a little bit that I wanted to finish up with the lump parameter tuning, um, you know, that I wanted to mention just so that you can finish up the last problem on the, on the home. Um, okay, so a lot of announcements to go through today, but, you know, um, and then after that, you know, we have an, another set of lecture notes um, and we're going to start talking about cardiovascular diseases. Okay? And so, um, you know, I, I do want, I, um, you know, um, with regards to the midterm, you know, the last topic that's going to be on the midterm is going to be lump parameter modeling. And so the little bit that we talk about today about, about LPM tuning, you know, um, I'm going to expect you to at least know, um, you know, at least conceptual, uh, you know, conceptually um, of, you know, what you need to do to tune a LPM. Uh, but once we start talking about cardiovascular diseases, that's, that's not going to be on the midterm. And so the cutoff of the midterm today will probably be, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And so, you know, I'll let you know at some point today is that after this moment, there, no, not, none of this stuff is going to be on the midterm next week. Um, and so, you know, um, just so, cause I, you know, we've, we've covered so much already that it's, uh, you know, I think there's, there's definitely more than enough that I can test you guys on. Okay. Um, but before that, um, Oh, and uh, you know, um, just like my email said today, um, someone um, someone emailed me this morning and saying they were getting a different answer for their homework three, problem three B, and so there was a typo in, in my code, and so I, I did correct that and I posted an updated version of that homework where you can you can view that on Canvas. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, so any questions on um, you know anything besides the exam besides the project? Because we'll talk about that soon. Uh, any any other questions that I can answer before we get started? Okay, All right. So first thing, let's talk about let's talk about the exam. Okay, and so I believe our, our exam date is set for next Tuesday, so it's, it's a week from today. Okay. Um, it's going to be Tuesday. I believe the date is March sixteenth. Okay, and so it's going to be uh, an in-class exam, and so it's going to take place, you know, during the duration of this um, of this lecture. Okay. And so the time, the time limit for the exam is going to be basically 5.30 p.m. until um, 7 p.m. Okay. Normally, these classes are, are, are only 75 minutes, but, you know, because it's a virtual exam, you know, I, I want to make sure you guys have time to scan your, um, your work um, and upload it, because I know there, there's always, you know, Something always goes wrong. It's standard breaks, phone breaks, you know, things, things happen. So, you know, I want to make sure that you have the extra time to do that. Um, you know, just to make sure that you can get everything in on time. All right. So let's talk exam format. And so, you know, you know, up to this point in the class, you know, we haven't actually done much, um, you know, calculations. I know LPM is kind of a kind of a, you know, um, a departure from that. But besides that, you know, most of the information that we've covered has just been uh, conceptual information. 
And so, um, <laughs> Kat is, uh, she's, she's, uh, she's letting everyone know she's done eating. Um, and so, you know, um, the exam is going to reflect this. And so um, basically the, the format of the exam is going to be a little bit different than, than, you know, what I'm, what I'm typically, you know, used to giving the exam. So it's good. there's going to be a much bigger emphasis on the conceptual questions. Right? And so on this exam, there's going to be, you can expect to have five conceptual short answer questions. And then in total, um, you know, these conceptual questions are going to make up 60% um, of the available points on the exam. Okay. And so definitely, you know, make sure that you're good on, on a lot of the concepts. So especially, you know, the unit that we did on arterial biomechanics, um, you know, you can expect a good amount of questions from that and just a good amount of questions just conceptually in general. Um, just because you know the nature of this class, um, you know a lot of the a lot of the computations, you know, are are kind of done in the computer. Um, you know, obviously, you know, for your final project, you're, you're going to be running CFD, um, but CFD is a class in itself, and you know, and we're not we're not going to get we're not going to get into the theory of CFD because that's that's like you know at least two graduate level courses that you need to really understand that that stuff. And so, you know, in terms of the calculations, you know, there's there's you know there's not much besides LPMs. And so I really want you guys to focus on the conceptual information. Uh, and so the rest of the 40, the, 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 the last 40% of the points, those are going to be made up with kind of one um, problem solving question. And that's going to be an LPM, um, LPM type question. Okay. Uh, professor, when you say conceptual, does that mean like all the way like from day one where you were talking about like the different definitions? Yep. Yeah, and so actually, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it in, in a bit, but um, you know, the uh, for your for the conceptual questions, you know, definitely look at the study guide that I've posted because I, I basically posted, you know, all the conceptual information that I kind of expect you to know, and I kind of posted it in a way that will help you kind of study uh, for that stuff. So definitely look at the study guide, and if you can answer all the questions on the study guide, you know, you're going to be in great shape for the conceptual questions on, on the exam. Thank you. Okay. And so this LPM question here, um, you know, I, I don't want you guys using MATLAB during the exam because it's, um, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not forbidding it, but I'm saying you're not, you're not going to need it on, um, on the exam. Okay. And so, you know, this LPM question, you know, the way it's going to work is that, you know, I'm going to give you a circuit. It's basically going to work exactly like problem two on the homework. And so I'm going to give you a circuit and then I want you to derive the ODEs that, that are associated with that LPM circuit. And so you're not going to have to implement it. You're not going to have to tune it. You know, I just want to make sure that you know you can you can take a circuit and then you know derive its its set of uh, different equations. Okay. All right. Uh, and so that's that's the format of the exam. Um, and you know, in terms of you know what materials you can use on the exam. And so since it's since it's take home, and I'm, I'm not going to be there in your um, you know in your houses with you because that would be weird. Uh, and so, you know, you can use, you know, any, any, any material that's, that's available to you. So you can use your personal notes, you can use the lecture notes, you can use the lecture videos, you know, you can use study guides, homework solutions, you know, all that, all that will be available for you um, to use. Okay? And so it's kind of, you know, open, kind of open everything. The only thing that I ask is that, you know, um, you know, I want this exam to be, you know, just kind of your own work. So the only thing I ask is that you please don't communicate with any, any of the other students in the, in the class. You know, until the exam period is over. So once the exam period is over, you can go ahead and you know talk to people in class. Um, but until that point, you know, I, I want you to you know just don't talk, don't communicate with other people during the exam. But besides that, you know, you can use um, anything that you want. Um, oh, and and don't use Chegg either. So no no outside websites um, as well. Um, I don't I don't know how how helpful those would be because this is kind of a very specialized class. But you know, don't I don't want to see any of the exam questions on on Chegg. Okay, because I, I I that happened a lot last semester. Okay. Uh, okay, um, and so um, you know during during the exam period, you know I, I will be here, so I'll I'll be on the call, so I'll be on our usual Zoom lectures, um, and so you can you can come to the Zoom the Zoom room if you want, but I'm I'm not going to require it, 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of all the proctoring softwares. And I know some other faculty have, you know, they, they, they've been doing stuff to proctor the exams. You know, I, you know, I, 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 I don't really want to, you know, because I know that, you know, if it were me, you know, I, I feel a lot of, you know, invasion of privacy or, you know, um, my professor watching me while I take the exam. And so, you know, you don't have to do any of that. You know, I, I, the only thing I ask is that, you know, um, you know, I, I'm kind of just I'm making a good faith ask that, you know, that you don't, you know, do anything unsavory to, to cheat. Right. Um, yeah, I hate, I, I would hate Procterio too. So, and so if you want to come to the Zoom call, you know, you're welcome to that, you know, and I'll be here to answer your questions. And so if you want to log into the Zoom room and you can message me questions here and I'd be happy to answer that, um, but it's not a requirement. So if you would rather, you know, keep Zoom off, um, then, you know, that's, that's, that's fine with me too. And if, if, and if, if you don't want to come to the Zoom, Zoom room and you want to ask me questions, uh, I'll be available on Discord and I'll be available on, um, on email as well. And so if you use either one of those, you just send me your question. I, I should respond to you within seconds because, you know, I'll be kind of here and, you know, watching kind of all my, um, all of my electronic communication. Uh, but, but attendance in the Zoom room is, is, is not required. Yeah, Proctorio does a lot of weird stuff that, you know, um, of course, you know, the, the, if, it's, if it was just used for exam proctoring, you know, okay, it's, it's creepy, but it's, you know, it's, it's fine. But what I'm more worried about is, you know, what, do, what else do they do with that information or data? So, you know, I don't want to subject you guys to that because that's, you know, um, you know because privacy is kind of a, a big, it's a big thing for me. So, you know, I don't want to, you know, um, put, put that on you guys too. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be no proctoring software. Uh, okay, um, so any questions about the exam format that I can answer? Oh, oh, oh the most important thing, I, I forgot the most important thing. So yeah, the, the study guide that I posted, you know, definitely look at the study guide. But, you know, in the other, the other thing in that email that I sent today um, was about the review, a review session. Okay? It's not really a review session, it's a review video. And so, um, you know, um, I've, I've also posted a poll on Canvas for you to vote on which topics that we've covered so far that you feel kind of most uncomfortable with. Right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take kind of the, the top two or three of those topics and then cover them in about, you know, an hour, hour 15 long review session that I'm going to record on Thursday morning. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do that to, you know, to kind of give you something else to kind of help you review and help you study. Um, and so for these review sessions, you know, typically I, I don't like to cover absolutely everything because, you know, we've covered so much. And if I try to cover everything within an hour, it just ends up being just very, um, very shallow and not, I think, not very helpful to people. So what I would prefer to do is I would prefer to like stick to the, you know, the top two or three topics that people seem to be struggling with and really kind of go in depth, maybe do an example for them uh, so that, you know, it can, it can really help you nail that down before the exam. So make, please make sure you vote in that poll. Um, and so I'm closing the poll at 10 a.m. on Thursday morning. And so if you vote on it before then, then, you know, your voice will be heard, you know, and I'll take your feedback into consideration for the review session. Okay. Uh, okay so now, now are there any questions about the, uh, about the exam format that I can answer? I have a question, Professor. Sure. Uh, about the conceptual uh, answers, we mm -hmm. cannot type on the word. We have to write on the paper. That's right, answers. So, so actually I, I've configured it so that the, the quiz will take place within um, Canvas's quiz tool. And so for the short answers, you, you can type in the browser. Um, and, I, and, I, um, and what I hope is that that'll be a little bit faster than you having to write it down and, and scan it. So for the short answer questions, you can type it in. It's easier to convert it to PDF. You know, that's when we type it and, uh, or convert the PDF to the word and uh, type it. And after that, convert it to PDF is so easier. That's why I uh, ask you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, you can you can do that too. Uh, and so if you want to if you want to just type it all into one PDF, because for the for the LPM question, it'll give you an option to to upload a PDF. Um, just upload that PDF with your short answer questions, and then just and then just let me know that you you said that you know all my short answer questions are all, all my short answer responses are in that PDF, and then I'll use that to to grade you. So that's that's totally fine too. Thank you, uh, Professor. I kind of missed a little bit about about that. Uh, just to uh, clarify. We can just write everything down handwritten on one paper, correct? And just scan it in as long yeah. as it's legible. Yeah, yeah, you can do that too. So if you okay. feel if you feel you know more comfortable writing it down and just scanning one PDF, you can you can do that as well. Um, but the yeah, option will be there if you if you want to type it into the browser, then you know that's that's available for you too. But either either way is fine with me. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions about the exam before we talk about the the final project? Okay. 
All right, so let me go ahead and share my laptop screen. Okay. And so this is the, uh, um, um, the specifications for the final project that I have on Canvas. And so you can actually, you know, find these on Canvas as well. So actually, let me show you where it is. All right. And so if you go to the Canvas site and you go to files, um, and then you go to this folder called project, you can find the PDF of the specs here. So I actually uploaded this sometime last week, um, but I kind of forgot to talk about it two days in a row. So today, today I wrote a sticky note to remind me to, to talk about it, uh, just to let you guys know. Okay. And so this this PDF that I'm showing you here, it's, it's on Canvas, and so um, you know you can you can download it and follow along here. Okay. All right. And so the the big due date, you know, is, it's it's going to be just like we talked about before. It's going to be basically the Sunday after Finals Week, so that's going to be Sunday, May 23rd, and so that's you know a little bit over two months from now. And so I'm giving you this, this project, you know, fairly early because I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's going to take, um, you know, quite a bit of time, especially with the, the model construction in some vast work. Right? And so, you know, kind of just like we, what we've been talking about, you know, the final project in this class is basically to use some vascular to build a, to build a model, a geometric model of someone's um, blood vessels and run a CFD simulation on this. Okay? And so to do this, you know, we're going to partner up with this uh, company called the Open Source Medical Software Corporation or OSMSC. Um, and they're going to be providing the image data for um, for this project. Okay, so I have all that image data. It's in a zip folder that's you know 89 gigabytes, uh, and so right now it's still zipped. But you know, so I want to try to avoid unzipping the whole thing. Otherwise, my computer will cry. Um, you know, um, and then you know, once once you've selected your model, then I can send you the image data. You know, I'll I'll send it I'll send a Dropbox transfer for you. Okay. okay, and so the main thing that I want to talk about today is selecting your model. Okay? So I know we talked about this kind of briefly before. Um, but you know, there's there's a wide variety of models that you can that you can pick. Okay, and so if you go to the OSMSC website, um, you know that I think people have linked before. What you should see is kind of a list and a bunch of pictures of all the available models. And so let me you know let me do that again. So can I go to OSMSC? No. Okay. And so if we go to repository. I'll, I'll send a link to this site. So, you know, you don't have to kind of follow along here. Right? And then you can, you know, click on a certain type of model and you can kind of, you know, see what's available. Okay? So I, I know a couple of people have already kind of emailed me and, and said what their preferences are. And so, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, but I want you to kind of go through this website and, and, you know, look at the models that are available and then pick one that, that you, that you fancy. Okay. okay. And just like I mentioned before too, that, you know, I'm, I'm okay with, you know, multiple people working on the same model. Um, because there's, there's a lot of models on there that I think are going to be, you know, way too complicated for people to kind of do within the span of, of this class, especially, especially with, you know, for beginners of some vascular. And so what I expect is, you know, a lot of people are going to be doing, working on the same kind of simple model. So, you know, these aorta models are, are great because, you know, they're relatively simple. They don't have too many outlets, but if you look at some of the other models that are available, like some of the pulmonary models, you know, these are, these are crazy. And so, you know, um, I think you know even even someone someone like me I think would would have a lot of trouble doing these these kinds of um, models. Okay. And so with that, you know, I, I went through the all the models that I have available and I've I've banned some of them. Okay. And so uh, I've looked at you know the list of models and I you know these are the models that I think are going to be a little bit too complicated for um, for you to do, um, you know, um, within the span of, of this class. Right? Um, so I'm not saying that you can't do them. And so you know what I'm saying is that it's if you really want to do a pulmonary model. <clears throat> um, then just be prepared that it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a really long process and, you know, you better have a really good computer to, to, you know, be able to model all of these vessels too. And so I'm not saying that you can't do these. I just kind of heavily, you know, recommend that you don't. And if you do do them, just, just kind of, just kind of know what you're kind of signing up for because it's, it's going to be a lot. Okay. Um, all right. And so the way that you're going to sign up is that, you know, after this class, um, probably sometime, um, sometime later tonight, I'm going to send out an email with a link to a Google Sheet. Okay. And so actually, let me show you that Google Sheet right now. Okay. And so this Google Sheet is very simple. And so it's just going to have a column for your name. It's going to have a column for the model number. And so the model number refers to this ID number right here. Okay. And so it's going to start with OSMSC um, and then some number there. And so I want you to write out what model number you're doing. And then <clears throat> also the type of model that you're doing. So you know, basically what, what kinds of blood vessels are you looking at in your, in your model, okay? Uh, and then once you kind of sign up here, then I'll, I'll set up a Dropbox link for you to download the, the image data for your, for your project, okay? Um, 
And so I'll send this out so you can, uh, you know, you can sign up here. Um, and, you know, repeats are okay. So if someone else has signed up for your model, like that's fine. Um, but, you know, if you, if you see that like four or five people have already signed up for a certain model, then, then maybe, maybe pick another one. Cause you know, I, I don't mind if some people work on the same one, but I don't want half the class working on the exact same model. Cause you know, I do want to see a little bit of feedback. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, and so that's the main thing that I want to talk about. So kind of just be on the lookout for that Google Sheet, okay? And the rest of this document kind of outlines the steps that you have to do, okay? And so part one of this project is that you're going to construct the construct the geometry, right? And so this was the subject of our first workshop. And so the first, if you remember from our first workshop, what we did was we, you know, we learned how to, you know, put down these path lines and also construct these, these segmentations that go, you know, all throughout. And so that's part one of the project. And so, you know, once you get your image data, you can actually already start working on part one, you know, because we've already kind of covered that in the, um, in the lectures. Okay. And then part two, which is going to be the subject for our second Symbascular workshop, which I think is going to take place, um, you know, the week, um, not next week, but probably the week after that, um, you know, um, then, you know, the subject of that workshop is how you can set up, how you're actually going to set up the CFD simulation. And so in the second workshop, we're going to cover uh, meshing, so how to mesh your geometry. We're going to set up how to set up the boundary conditions. Um, and I'll show you how to get access to the supercomputing cluster so that you can run your, your simulations as well. Okay. So that's, that's going to be the subject for the second, uh, the second workshop. Okay. And so there's, there's a lot of details here on how you can actually compute your boundary conditions. Okay. So I'm not going to go over everything right now because you know, we'll go over a lot of that in the second workshop. Um, but I do want to let you know that you know, a lot of that information is here. And then once you run your CFD simulation, the last step is that you know you're going to have to write your report, okay? And so a lot of a lot of the rest of these specs are just kind of details on how you write the final report. So the the final report, you know, it's it's a lot of very standard components. So so it's going to have an abstract, it's going to have a, a background, it's going to have a method section, um, it's going to have a section for your results and a conclusion section, okay? And so definitely read the specs, um, you know, just to see you know what I kind of expect in each in each section. Because um, you know, um, but once you have your simulation results, you'll you'll have kind of everything that you need to to write the report. Okay? Okay. And so, just a reminder too that this is a an individual project, and so you know, even if you're going to work on the same model as your friend, you know, I want everyone to go through the same you know steps. So everyone should be building a Symbascular model. Everyone should be running their own simulation, okay? um, and everyone, of course, should be writing their own report. Okay. And so you know, even though some people are going to be doubling up, you know, please make sure you're doing everything um, yourself. Okay. And you know, um, also you know, it's 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 a lot of work, and so you know, don't don't be afraid to kind of reach out because I think you know, especially when you're building the model, you know, you're going to run into a lot of snacks because you know, a lot of these image data are not going to be not, they're not going to be that nice, and so you know, definitely don't be afraid to reach out for help if if you need it because you know, it's uh you know, it's it's going to be a tough tough process. Okay. Oh, one, fi one final thing. And so just to kind of make sure that, you know, you're, you're kind of on track to, for, to, um, to construct the geometry, I am adding kind of a, a soft deadline here. And so by Friday, April 16th, which is, you know, about a month from now, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll push this back by a week. You know, I want you to have your geometry all, all done. Okay, so you should have, you know, your paths and your segmentations and your model done by, we'll, we'll say, we'll, we'll push this back. So I'll say, you know, we'll have, we'll have it done by the 23rd of, of, of April. And so, you know, I want to I make sure you do that just so that you have enough time to, you know, to, to configure the simulation and run it and also to write your report. Because, you know, the biggest sticking point that I see is for most people is, is constructing the model. And so, you know, I want to make sure you're done with that by that point. Because, you know, what I want to avoid is a situation by, you know, by, you know, May 22nd, you know, you come to me and say, you know, you haven't even constructed your model yet. Because um, if you're coming to me, you know, a day before and you haven't constructed your model, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the only thing I can say is that, you know, you're, you're kind of screwed at that point. And so I want to avoid that situation. So, you know, by, by April 23rd, you know, about a month and a half from now, I want you to, uh, you know, finish uh, constructing your model so that, you know, you're ready to run your simulation and you're ready to start your, your analysis. Okay. Uh, so any questions on the, um, on the final report or the final project? I might have missed it, but will you be posting this uh, document on Canvas? Yes, yeah. So this this document is already on Canvas, and so if you go to the Canvas site, um, you know this is for our class four forty two, and you go click the files um, link here, 
and then there's a folder here called project and then this this document is here for, for you to look at. Yeah, and if you also, you know, I, I know some people were having issues with SimVascular, um, you know, um, during our first workshop. And so if, if you're still having issues with SimVascular, um, you know, definitely, you know, let um, send me an email just to kind of remind me. And so just to kind of um, start the conversation um, as well, because, you know, I've, I've been kind of thinking about, you know, what's the best best way to approach it if you're having um, issues with SimVascular. Um, but I think I think it's, I think I'm just going to have to take it on a case by case basis. And so you know, if, you, if you're having issues with SimVascular, you know, either the modeling is not working or, or, you know, the segmentation is not working, yeah, shoot me another email um, and then, you know, and I'll, I'll work, I'll work, um, you know, I'll work with you to kind of um, find a solution. Okay. All right. So, uh, Professor. Yeah. So, the models, uh, the picture to the right of the models, is that like what we're going to be like, uh, like, you know, on the page, on the SimVascular page, like where we get to pick, uh, the model we want to do. Yep. So mm -hmm. that's what it would look like, right? That's what we're aiming for. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah, so, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So for uh, for all of these um, image data, you should have a, a a picture of the model, and so this this will basically um, serve as your reference for what to what to do. And so I I'm you know you know these models were were I'm not going to say professionally done because they were just done by kind of you know grad students that were just you know looking to graduate. You know, but they were done by people you know who have you know some experience with this so um and so don't stress out about you know getting everything exactly right and so especially if you have a model like this where you have a ton of vessels and so if you missed you know a few vessels or you know your vessels look a little bit different from this i'm you know i'm don't don't stress out too much about it um but you know you should you should kind of have most of the essential features right and so let's say if you know if you're working on this model right here you know this model was not that bad because it, it only has a few I, I i am going to expect you to have you know I should see this arch right here, and I should see these vessels kind of come off the top. And so the major feature should be there, but you know, don't you don't have to don't stress about getting it exactly exactly right because you know this is this is going to be your first time for for you know um, for basically all of you. And so um, you know because it's your first time, you know, I, and I'm not going to expect perfection, so don't don't stress out too much. But I should I should still be able to see kind of the major features um, in the model. Professor, for that first model, how? Like if you were to do it, how long would you say it would take you to do it? Just for reference. Uh, for me, uh, for something for something like this, probably I, I could probably knock out the entire thing in a, in about a um, couple hours, I would say. Um, so the most time consuming thing is definitely the the paths. And so once you have the paths down, then you know segmentation from that is is you know not that bad. Um, and then from there you can you can lock it. So I would say about a couple hours for for me. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, professor? Yep. So you mentioned the poll for the review session. Sorry, yes. I didn't have to do with the project. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you said uh, it was emailed? Yes, I believe so. Let me check. Yeah, so this is this is the email that I sent out today. And so there's a there's a poll. And so if, if you didn't get the email, you can check the announcements tab in uh, um, on the Canvas site. Um, and you can do that there. You can access it from here too. So if you go to quizzes on the Canvas site, oh, you're not supposed to see that yet. But you know, there's, there's, you know, that's that's where your midterm is going to be. Um, then you can click the review poll here, and you can take it to, um, and you can take it here as well. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Any final questions on the uh, on either the exam or or the final project? Right. So a lot of announcements today, but you know, um, you know, definitely, you know, kind of have both of those those things in mind. But you know, first thing, you know, choose uh, first thing, you know, choose a model, and then you know, focus on just uh, studying for the, the midterm exam. Okay. All right. So let me go ahead and, and bring back my iPad. All right. Google Doc is going up uh, right after this 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 lecture. So I'll I'll, I'll email everyone the link to the Google Doc. And I'll, I'll email you a link to the repository as well. So you can um, you, you can have the link so that you can kind of browse all the different models. Okay. All right. And so let's uh, so let's pick up where we left off on lump parameter modeling. And I, I believe we left off on the on the tune. Right. 
And so this is the subject of, of basically problem four on the on the uh, on the current homework assignment, homework three. Okay. And so just to kind of remind you, you know, uh, when I when I say to uh, to tune an LPM, uh, what I mean by that is, um, you know, what you're going to be doing is you're going to take the values for all the all the circuit elements, so all the resistors, capacitors, inductors, and then kind of you know um, tinkering and modifying those values until your results match um, a certain term. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, before we kind of move on, you know, I, I will say that this, this idea of tuning um, is not unique to just cardiovascular um, models. And so actually this, this, this is kind of a, a big um, issue in any kind of computational science, right? So whether you're using like ANSYS or using open foam, so anytime you're performing a simulation, you know, um, all, basically all simulations have a certain, have certain parameters in the model that you can tinker. And so, um, you know, a lot of times what you want is you want to, you want to make sure that your simulation matches, um, you know, what's happening in reality as, as closely as, as closely as possible. Um, and so, you know, this, this whole field of, you know, tuning computational parameters, you know, probably what you'll see in, in, you know, um, in other fields is you'll see them call it something like parameter selection or parameter optimization. Um, or just optimization in general, and so you know this is this is not something that's unique, and so every every computational model has this issue where you know um, you know there's always a question of you know what are the best values of the parameters in in the model. All right, but you know specifically for for cardiovascular simulations, you know the kinds of targets that we're looking at are things like you know we want to make sure that what we get for you know our results for the pressure and for the flow they match, uh, first of all, that they match, you know, normal human values, or sometimes, you know, we want them to match specific, one specific human's blood pressure or one specific human's, you know, flow rate. Right? Okay. Uh, and in fact, you know, with the LPMs that we've considered now, you know, that's that's the only thing that you can really tune. So you can really only tune just the for the blood pressures and flow rates. That's that's our primary outputs. Okay. Okay. And so I think we're specifically where we left off is we, we I was talking about you know rules of thumb uh, for tuning your LPM. Okay. And so because when you're when you're approaching these tuning problems or, or parameter selection or you know whatever you call it, you know. Um, the wrong approach to do is to is to you know just change things randomly, right? And so you know what you can do is you can you know take your LPM or you can take your ANSYS simulation or whatever, and you say let me change this value, let me just multiply by two just for random, and let me see what happens. Um, and then say oh that didn't work, let me multiply by three now. Oh that didn't work, let me multiply by four, right? That's not what you want to do. And so you know because uh, you know even though these simulations can be fast, you don't want to be sitting at your computer just trying random stuff until something until something sticks. Um, because, you know, um, for some computational models, you might have, you know, dozens or even hundreds of different parameters. And so, you know, you don't want to be testing out, you know, each of those hundreds of parameters and each combinations of those different parameters, you know, changing those, uh, and you'll find very quickly that it's, it's, it's an impossible task. Okay? And so anytime you're approaching like a tuning problem or a parameter estimation, you want to have some good rules of thumb, right? And oftentimes your rules of thumb, they're going to be driven by, you know, um, your physical intuition or your knowledge of the physics um, behind the, the simulation.
and so you know um you know you, you guys not so much but you know for for a lot of my other computational classes so i'm also teaching you know finite elements this semester and also computational heat transfer you know i make a really big deal about you know we have to understand the physics behind you know the situation we have to have a good physical intuition for what's going on because you know running being a good computational engineer is more than just you know i know how to use ANSYS or you know i know how to use matlab like you have to have a good you know fundamental understanding of fluid, of either you know structural mechanics fluid mechanics heat transfer you know whatever whatever is your modeling um, because otherwise you know you're not going to be able to run good simulations because you're not going to be able to know you know what you're really going to be looking for okay and so you know I, I always really stress that to the point where you know i know it's really annoying for you know for a lot of the students but you know, it is extremely important, you know, when you're doing modeling so that, that you know kind of what you're looking for. Okay. All right, and so let's let's talk about, you know, um, what things that we should look out for and, you know, what are some general behaviors that you can expect uh, for cardiovascular simulations, okay? All right, and so the first rule of thumb that, you know, I, um, I wanna mention is uh, with regards to the resistances, okay? And so the resistances are kind of in their own category because they, they don't have a differential equation that governs their behavior. Okay? And so the first step, you know, when you're tuning an LPM is I want you to tune the resistances first because these are going to set, these are going to set uh, your mean behavior. Okay? Um, you know, and the reason you, you do this is because, you know, mean behavior is often kind of, that's kind of the easier target to, to hit first, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and so the way that we, the, the way that you can set your resistances is, um, you know, you can make use of our Ohm's law, right? Okay. Now remember, our Ohm's law basically says that the resistance, and we'll call this the total resistance. Okay. Um, actually, let me just call it resistance for now. Okay. So we'll say that resistance is going to be equal to um, the mean pressure. And then we're going to divide this by um, the mean flow rate. Okay. And so one easy way that you can find your resistance values is just simply just take the ratio of you know the mean pressure and the mean flow rate in your in your model. Okay. Um, and that will tell you you know what your resistance value should be. Okay. Um, and so um, you know let me uh, I'm going to apply this to the to the previous example um, that we did kind of last week. Um, and then I'll show you kind of, you know, how I, how I obtained the resistance value that, that I used. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. And so let's, uh, so let's do a quick example, you know, based on, you know, um, our targets from, from the previous example. Okay. okay. And so let's say that we have a target, um, a target average pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury. And we have a target average flow rate of 40 milliliters per second. Okay. And so to get the resistance values for this, uh, or the resistance that you specify, you just divide the two. Okay. And so we're going to take 90 and then we're going to divide by 40. Okay. And it's going to be 2.25. Okay. 
And if you recall, you know, from the previous example, you know, what you should see is that this is exactly what we specified for the value of R2. And you know R two. This was the resistor at the very back of our um, of our circuit. Um, and so, you know, when you're computing these resistance values and, you know, you're wondering, you know, where you should specify or where you should assign them, you know, you should, you should start with trying to assign the resistances at the end of your circuit, okay? Because in general, you know, what you find is that the resistances near the back of your LPNs, they have, these have the most influence on the mean properties. on the mean property, sorry. Okay. Uh, and so in fact, you know, um, all the resistances that are um, more towards the front, you know, these actually have very little effect on the results. So actually you can take our, our second example from last time and you could try changing that re um, first resistance R1, you can try changing something extreme like, like 50. Um, and then you, you'll see that the results don't actually change that much. All right, so question. So in the back, do I mean initially? So in the, by in the back, what I mean is um, where it's kind of physically located. So I think the example that we were doing last time looks something like this, right? And so this is R1 and this is R2. Okay. And so by in the back, what I mean, you know, the ones that are closest to ground. And so I mean uh, this guy right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the so the locations of the resistors are fixed, um, and then you know uh, when you're tuning that, make sure you pick the ones kind of near near the back of it to uh, to specify your values. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and you know the reason for this, you know, we'll we'll go over on the next page. But you know um, this has kind of a very kind of um, intuitive kind of physical uh, reason for that. Um, but you know. We'll do on the next page. Um, are there any other questions on, on this page here? Okay. All right. And so why, why is it the resistances in the back? Why did those have the most influence, right? And so the reason for that is this, this reflects the fact that, you know, most of the viscous losses, um, these always occur in the capillaries of, of the person's body, right? And remember, the reason for this is, you know, the capillaries are, are really, really tiny. Right? And since resistances are basically, you know, supposed to model, you know, the effect of viscous energy loss or viscous friction, it makes sense that the capillaries, which are always at the end of our arterial tree, you know, that's where, you know, those resistances are going to have the most effect on our results. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, the resistors, whenever you see kind of a resistor in the back of a lump parameter model, uh, you know, um, you can basically say that, you know, this is going to be the resistance of those capillaries. Okay? And those are going to be, you know, those are going to become the most influential. Okay? All right. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, the most common question that, that comes up from this is, you know, what if you have multiple resistors at the end of an LPN? Okay. Okay. 
because in the in the previous example, we just have kind of one resistor at the tail end. But what if you have kind of more than one? And so let's say that, you know, let's say that we have three different branches here. And let's say that all these are connected to ground. So all of these are kind of in the back. We'll call this R1, R2, R3. Okay. And so how do you tune these resistances, you know, if they're all kind of in the same place? Right. And so one thing that you can do here is that you can um, basically split them in parallel. And so what you can basically say is that, you know, um, if you kind of remember your, your circuit laws, if you have kind of parallel circuits like this, the way that you can combine them is you can say that one over R total, which is kind of the equivalent resistance for, for these guys, could be one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R3. And so, you know, let's uh, just for a second, let's assume that um, all three of these have the same value. Okay. And so let's say that all their values are R. Okay. So I have one over R total is equal to one over R plus one over R plus one over R, okay? If we kind of simplify this expression, what we, uh, what we find is, is that R, which are, you know, the, all these are the individual resistances, this is gonna be three times R total, okay? And so again, this R right here, this is the individual resistances that we assign. And then this R total right here, this R total is, you know, what we would, what we would compute using our Ohm's law over here. Okay. And so kind of the, the general process that we, that we say that we, that we undertake is that, you know, um, first we compute a total resistance, a total, you know, back resistance um, based on the Ohm's law and based on the mean pressure and the mean flow, then if you have multiple branches at the end of your circuit, then what we say is we take that total resistance and we split it among all of the kind of all the tail resistances. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, we'll we'll see this exact process um, in, in in action. You know, because this is actually what Symvascular does as well. And so, it, you know, Symvascular, you know, if you have you know a vessel with multiple or a model with multiple vessels. You know, we need a way to kind of split resistances across those different vessels. And you'll see, what you'll see during our second workshop is that Symvascular has a way to kind of do this um, automatically. All right, uh, any questions on, um, on this? Okay. All right, and so that's the resistances. Remember, you know, when, it, when you're tuning an LPN, um, first thing that you should do is you should tune the resistances to match the mean behavior. And so if your mean flow, your mean pressures are a little bit off, then tune your resistances to make sure that they, that they match up. Okay. All right, and so once your mean behavior is set, the next step is to tune the capacitances and inductances. Um, and the indexes and capacitances, they, they play a very different role on your, on your LPM simulation. And so instead of adjusting the mean values, what these will do is that these will um, modify, these are going to modify the peak to peak values in your simulations. Uh, 
Uh, and so, because uh, you know the the you know besides the mean um, values, you know the other thing that we want to make sure is that you know our difference between our maximum and our minimum kind of reach um, have a certain um, you know hit our targets, right? Because there's a difference. So it, you know two people you know could have the same mean blood pressure, you know, but their waveforms might look something like this. Right? And so, you know, let's assume that these guys have the same mean, okay? And so let's say that, you know, the mean looks like this, okay? And so they're all gonna be, you know, oscillating around these mean, but one person might have a blood pressure that looks like this, okay? Whereas another person might have a blood pressure that looks like this, okay? And so, you know, obviously these two curves are, are very different, right? And so, you know, we want to make sure that we not only capture the mean behavior, but we capture this kind of peak to peak um, values as well. Okay. And the way that we do this is with through the inductances and capacitance. And, and so luckily here, you know, the inductance and capacitance, they actually kind of lead to the same effect, um, at least in terms of peak to peak behavior. And the relationship that's there is, is actually an inverse one. And so what I mean by inverse is that if you increase the inductance and capacitance, um, then what that's going to do is going to lower the peak to peak amplitude. But if you decrease the capacitance, then it's actually going to increase the, the magnitude. Okay? And so let me kind of draw a figure here to kind of show you, because uh, I think it's kind of easiest to show with the figure. Right? And so let's say that we have a waveform that looks like this. And then from here, we have basically two paths that we can do. Okay? And so on the top path here, you know, let's say that we take this, uh, we take this waveform and we increase our uh, capacitance slash inductance. And so if we increase the capacitance um, slash inductance, what you should see is, is a curve that looks a lot flatter. Right? And so you can see that the peak to peak amplitude in this, in this graph that I drew has decreased dramatically. Whereas if you decrease the, the induction capacitance, it's going to have the opposite effect, right? And so if we are, if our oscillations start like that, what's going to happen is that the oscillations are going to grow bigger. Okay. All right. And so, you know, when you're tuning for the peak to peak stuff, you know, keep this in mind that, you know, there's this inverse relationship if you increase um, inductance and capacitance, you should see that, you know, the, the, the your, your, um, your oscillations kind of get um, smushed, but if you decrease it, then it, it actually increases from, from there. All right, uh, any questions on, on this so far? Yeah, actually, yeah. So Manuel made a, a really good comment. So actually, you know, this is um, actually, you know, um, you know, all this is kind of based on, you know, circuit, um, circuit ideology. And so, um, you know, there is kind of a mathematical way that you can kind of formulate these, um, these guys too. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just telling you, um, you know, kind of the overall effects that, that you would kind of um, experience. But you can, you can definitely kind of work these out mathematically as, as well. So they can kind of get like an exact um, expression for these guys. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I'm kind of, you know, talking about capacitances and inductance is kind of, you know, qualitatively like this is that, you know, oftentimes when you have a, a much more complicated circuit, it gets a lot more difficult to form like, like an exact mathematical expression. And so usually what's what's actually easier is to kind of, you know, say that, you know, here's here's my key inductor, here's my key capacitor. Let me just adjust this value and kind of just kind of see what happens, right? It's not changing it randomly. So it's, you know, you know you're not you know, changing it, you know, just at your will, but you're saying, you know, I have this target I need to hit. Let me decrease the value a little bit and to see, see what happens, right? Let's see. So the mean value is not changed, but the amplitude and the period. So actually, you know, the, the period also doesn't change. And so what you should mostly see is that the, um, the amplitude um, should change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. The mean values are not going to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, you know, the next question to, to ask about this is that, you know, just like resistances, 
is there kind of a key location where you need to where you know you, you need to pay special attention to the capacitors and inductors? Um, and the answer to that is is yes too. And the and the uh, location for this is actually opposite from what it from you know what's true about resistances, right? Because with resistances we saw that you know we want to adjust the resistances at the back of our circuit. You know the opposite is true for the capacitors and inductors. We want to focus on the capacitors and inductors at the beginning of the LPN. Uh, and this has a physical reason as well, right? Because remember what remember what capacitors and inductors represent, right? Capacitors represent the capacity for a blood vessel to kind of temporarily expand and store flow, uh, whereas an inductor that measures, you know, how much inertia or how much, you know, um, you know how much mass is basically in a blood vessel, right? And these are typically, you know, these effects are a lot more pronounced in the larger vessels. Uh, and where do you typically find the larger, um, you know, the larger um, vessels? Those are typically found near the beginning of your um, of your arterial tree, right? And so, you know, the vessels that are closer to the heart, um, you know, those are typically where your your bigger vessels are. Right? And so, generally, you know, when you go when you travel from the capillaries back towards the heart, you know, what you should what you should see is that the vessels kind of grow in size from that, right? And we saw that with the Murray swan too, right? And so, generally, all your larger blood vessels are near the beginning. Um, and that's where, you know, the capacitance and inductance effects are going to be most, uh, most pronounced. Okay. And so when you're tuning for the peak to peak, you know, um, peak to peak, um, you know, amplitudes here, you know, look at your circuit and find out, you know, where's the most, um, where's the earliest inductor slash capacitor that I see in the circuit. And then let me play with that value first and then, you know, and then see if I can adjust the peak to peaks from, from there. Uh, all right. So, any final questions on tuning and tuning and LPM? Okay. All right. And so, if you if you follow these two rules of thumb, you know that should help you out. You know, um, pretty significantly in doing problem four on on the homework. Okay. So, problem four on on homework three is you know I want you to basically take those circuits that you wrote the equation for and then tune its values to match you know a set of targets. All right. And so uh, we have significantly less time than I thought, but uh, it's okay. And so let, let me spend the last uh, 15 minutes today talking about um, just kind of introducing the idea of uh, cardiovascular diseases. Right? So let me go ahead and share my laptop screen again. Right. right. And so I'm back on PowerPoint slides, um, you know, and the reason for that is, you know, just to mostly just to show you guys pictures, right? And so, you know, I, I usually don't prefer this, but, you know, it's better to show uh, an image of, of an aneurysm than for me to kind of try to draw it on my iPad and, you know, for it to not look anything like it. Right? Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is going to be another case where, you know, I, I have these lecture slides, I'm just going to kind of talk over them. Uh, but there's no calculations to do here. It's, it's just kind of general information about, you know, cardiovascular diseases and also medical illnesses. Okay? And so first thing we're going to do is we're, we're going to talk about, you know, what are the most common cardiovascular diseases, you know, why we want to study them. And then at the end, you know, we'll talk a bit about the medical devices that, that can be used to treat them. Okay. okay. And so here's the learning objectives for this uh, for this lecture. So you know, it looks like a lot um, because it's it's a lot of conceptual information stuff. Right? Oh yes. And so um, at this point, you know, I'm starting from now. None of this will be on the first midterm. Okay. So we've already kind of you know now that we're done with the tuning stuff, you know, from this point onwards, you don't have to worry about you know any of the stuff being on the first midterm. But it will be on the second one. So you know. Uh, don't 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 throw this away, um, especially because you know a lot of this information is really interesting too. Because 
um, you know, I, I'm not sure about you guys, but, you know, I, I personally have a lot of, you know, relatives in my family that have um, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these conditions as well. So, you know, um, learning this stuff is just kind of good, just good knowledge just to know. Um, cause if you're, if you're ever in a position where like you have to take a family member to the doctor about like, you know, high blood pressure, you know, um, based on, you know, what I'm hoping is that based on what you learn, you know, not only from this class, but, you know, from this lecture, you know, you'll know what the right questions to ask the doctor and, you know, you'll kind of better understand kind of what's physically going on in your, you know, either in, you know, hopefully not your body, but, you know, maybe your, your relatives and, you know, hopefully not your relatives, of course. Too. Okay. And so what are cardiovascular diseases? And so, you know, when, when someone mentions cardiovascular disease, you know, they can actually refer to, you know, lots and lots of different things, right? And so the definition that, you know, that I'm going to roll with for this class is that cardiovascular disease is basically any abnormality um, that you can see in the cardiovascular system um, that can cause disruptions in blood flow. Okay? Uh, and, these, and these disruptions, what they ultimately do is they're going to need lead to uh, negative health consequences for, um, for patients. So that can either be loss of life um, or reduced quality of life. Okay? Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, these are a big issue worldwide. So it's, gonna, it's a major cause of death. Um, and it, it actually accounts for, you know, by some statistics of, of 50% of all deaths um, in the world. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's huge, right? And so there's, there's many, many different kinds of disease out there, you know, and there's, there's actually way too many for us to cover, even, you know, even if we spent this entire class just talking about cardiovascular diseases, you know, there's way too many out there to really, you know, get a full kind of picture of them, right? Um, but, you know, we're, in this class, you know, we're in this lecture, you know, we're going to cover, you know, probably some of the most important ones that you'll probably see most often. You know, after that. Um, and, you know, probably the question you're asking is, you know, why do, why is it important for us, for, you know, engineers to know about these disease mechanics? So isn't, isn't this the job of doctors to, uh, and surgeons to, to know about this? Uh, well, you know, um, you know, it's important for us to know because, you know, if you're going to be working in the biomedical field, you know, chances are you're going to be designing, you know, some kind of medical device or, you know, some kind of, you know, robot or something um, to help kind of treat these diseases. Okay? And so if you understand these disease mechanics and how they work, you know, it's going to better inform you. It's going to help you design a much better, you know, medical device or a much better, you know, robot or a much better therapy, much better, you know, procedure. Okay? And so, you know, I would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's probably not a responsibility to know you know, as in depth as like, you know, it's like a medical student or like a medical doctor, but you should still understand, you know, what's going on so that you can, you know, so you can perform your own work better. Okay? And also, you know, just like we talked about at the beginning, you know, just, just, just for your own knowledge too, because, you know, chances are, you know, you or someone you're, or, or someone you, you, you care about, you know, is going to have some, some kind of cardiovascular disease too. Okay? And having some knowledge about, you know, these disease mechanics will really help you, you know, go to the doctor and, you know, ask the right questions. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, help take care of your, of your loved one kind of in, in the best way possible. Okay. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is that a lot of these diseases are actually very closely, um, closely linked and closely related to fluid mechanics, which is, you know, a very engineering type of subject. Right? And so some examples that we're going to talk about in this, in, you know, in this lecture is hypertension, uh, which is another name for high blood pressure, right? And so that's a very common one. Uh, we're also going to talk about atherosclerosis. And, which is a word I hate saying because I always say it incorrectly, but that's basically, you know, the disease of plaque buildup in your, in your blood vessels, right? Um, and so kind of the scientific name for that is atherosclerosis. Um, and then we'll also talk about aneurysms, which I think are um, probably one of the most misunderstood or mis, uh, misused um, cardiovascular disease um, out there, right? And so contrary to popular belief, you can't pop, you can't pop an aneurysm. So you can't get really angry at something and then have an aneurysm show up in your, in your head. So that's, that's, that's not possible. That's, that, that's not a thing. Uh, but people say, but I see, hear people saying that more and more nowadays. And it kind of, you know, kind of um, pissed me off. It, it's kind of annoys me. Yeah. yeah. Aneurysms are really scary. Yes. Yes. They're, they're probably, um, probably among the most scary ones just because, you know, a lot of times they don't show any symptoms until it's, it's kind of too late, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about those kind of later on, you know, in the, uh, in the lecture today. Okay. Right. And then, you know, just like I mentioned, you know, later on, we'll also discuss some common medical devices um, that are used to treat these, um, treat these diseases. Okay. So we'll go a little bit into how those medical devices are designed. Um, and, you know, and likely, you know, you might, you might work on some of these medical devices if you end up working for like, you know, a biomedical company after this. So, you know, that'll be kind of good information to know. Uh, okay, so any questions, uh, any questions so far? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, so aneurysms, you know, they're, um, you know, they're, a lot of people refer to them as kind of like a silent, um, a silent ticking bomb, um, you know, and actually, you know, the statistic is really scary. So actually, um, you know, um, by some, by some statistics, by based on what they've seen, um, one in 10 people have, have an aneurysm somewhere in their body. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's scary that, you know, in this classroom, you know, probably odds are three or four, three or four of us have an aneurysm somewhere, and, you know, and we just don't really know about it. And what can be really dangerous about aneurysms is that um, is that they can rupture, um, and if they rupture, you know that causes significant internal bleeding, which you know, which is really bad. Um, and kind of the worst thing is that you know one of the more common areas for aneurysm to form is in your brain, actually. And so you know if you have kind of as you can imagine, you have internal bleeding in your brain, you know that's that's really bad. And you know and you know by the second you know if you have internal bleeding in your brain, you can. Um, you know, it can lead to a lot of loss of function. So, you know, in the worst case, you could pass away very quickly. You know, in the very best case, you know, you could have very impeded, um, you know, um, you know, impeded functions. Yeah. It happens in the brain a lot because actually, you know, it, because of the structure of the, of the blood vessels of your brain, actually. So the, the, the blood vessels in your brain have a very, very unique structure. Um, actually, if, if you guys do your final project on, you know, on cerebral vasculature, blood vessels in your brain, you actually see that, you know, you'll, you'll see that. And so the brain has a certain blood vessel called, it's called the circle of Willis. And so it's, it's a, it's a structure that's, that's, you know, that's, um, that's totally unique. And so you don't, you don't see that kind of structure anywhere else in your body. Um, and what it is is basically it's, it's a full loop of blood that, that basically happens in your brain. Um, and then from that loop, you know, the, the blood kind of branches off into different parts. Um, and so that's, that's very unique. So you don't have kind of a full kind of enclosed loop like that. And because of that structure, what you have is kind of fluid particles that kind of, that kind of strike the vessel wall uh, more common in the brain than they do in other parts of the body. And so that's kind of why, you know, aneurysms kind of form more often than, than, than not. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that more once we get to aneurysm, probably, probably on, on Thursday. Okay, all right, so let's talk about hypertension. And so hypertension, um, you know, is, it's kind of the, the scientific term for high blood pressure, right? And so, you know, when someone says you have hypertension, all that means is that your blood pressures are elevated. Um, and, you know, this is, this is probably the one that you see most common. And so, uh, you know, anytime you, like you turn on the TV and you hear, you know, a, a commercial, um, you know, whether it be, you know, for some kind of drug or be for Honey Nut Cheerios or something, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of out there that, you know, that helps people with, you know, high blood pressure. Uh, and for good reason. And because, you know, just a lot of people have um, high blood pressure. Um, and so I will say that there's there's no kind of cutoff, and so there's no you know exact say that you, so like there's no threshold where like if you have a blood pressure above X, you know then you have high blood pressure. Or there, so there's it's nothing like that, and so it's kind of you know um, it's kind of more of a um, kind of a, a term that people use for you know blood pressure that seems higher than normal. Okay, um, and so you know typically the ideal blood pressure for an adult is about 120 over 80, and so that's 120 um, millimeters of mercury systolic. And 80 millimeters of mercury diastolic. Okay? And if you have any kind of blood pressure above this, then that's typically considered hypertension. Okay? And so, you know, some typical typical values where you know doctors might start to get concerned is that if you have a systolic blood pressure above 140 and a diastolic pressure above 90, then that's that's when people start to get concerned. Okay? Uh, and so, you know, this affects you know a very large percent of the population. And so, you know, a third of the adults in the UK actually. Um, have been diagnosed with hypertension to some degree, and you know, um, you know, and you know, there was, and you know, what causes hypertension is kind of a, it's kind of a combination of a lot of lifestyle factors, right? And so one big thing is if you if you eat food with a lot of salt, and so salt, you know, has a lot of sodium, which you know has um, effects to raise your blood pressure, right? If you don't uh, if you don't exercise, um, and if you're stressed, you know, all of these kind of factors kind of contribute to high blood pressure. So there's there's usually not one thing, so it's usually not just one thing for, for certain people, but it's usually a combination for a lot of these things. Okay? Um, and high blood pressure itself, you know, is, is you know, by itself, it's, 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 it's not bad. It just, it, you know, food, speaking from a food mechanics point of view, it just means that your flow is more pressurized than, than other ones, which, you know, by itself is, is not that bad, right? So if your sink has more pressure, you know, it's, it's not worse or better than another sink. But what, but the concern uh, when you have high blood pressure is all the effects it has on, you know, all your other organs. Right? Um, and so pr primarily your heart. And so if you have elevated blood pressure in your body, you know, um, the, the, the thing in your body that's going to be feeling that the most is your heart, right? 
And so if you imagine your heart is constantly pumping, right? And if you have elevated blood pressure, your heart is gonna be pumping against that higher pressure, right? And so if you have a, you know, a, a mean pressure, you know, a systolic pressure of 140, you know, that's, you know, you could think of it as that much more work that your heart has to do on each pump, right? And eventually, you know, what can happen is that, you know, if you, if you have high blood pressure for an extended period of time, your heart like literally tires itself out because it's pumping against this high pressure, you know, all the time, right? Um, and so, you know, if you have, you know, one of the big concerns about elevated blood pressure, you know, over a long period of time is that this is one thing that can lead to heart failure, you know, which is obviously, you know, um, you know can lead to death. Um, and, um, you know, how, and, you know, um, treatment for blood pressure usually involves, you know, um, overall lifestyle changes. And so there's usually not a magic drug that you can take or a magic treatment that you can take to affect blood pressure, but it's usually kind of a holistic kind of treatment. And so, you know, what doctors will always recommend is that, you know, you increase the amount of exercise, you know, you watch your diet, you watch the amount of salt and, you know, and over time, you know, these lifestyle changes will lower your, your blood pressure. All right, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay. And so uh, now let's, let's, let's take kind of just a reminder to quantify blood pressure. So, you know, all of this you've seen before. And so, you know, we talked a lot about this in our, in our lectures on arterial biomechanics, uh, but let's kind of just kind of go over it again, right? And so, you know, when you're characterizing pressure, there's, there's kind of two things, or two, there's kind of two ways that you can, you can characterize it, right? And so the first way that you can characterize it is by pulse pressure. And so the pulse pressure is basically just the difference between the peaks, right? And so pulse pressure is basically just the, the peak to peak pressure or the amplitude, uh, you know, if you want to call it that, okay? Uh, and the other way that we quantify blood pressure is by the mean pressure, okay? And so the mean pressure is just kind of the mean of the, of the pressure waveform that you see here, okay? Um, and this mean blood pressure, um, you know, it's, it's actually a function or way, one way that you can refute it is actually from our Ohm's law, right? And so, you know, it's, it's in words right here, but you can basically say that, you know, what we have here is pressure, which is equal to cardiac output. So cardiac output, you can kind of think of it as, you know, what it is is basically the flow rate of blood that comes out from your heart. And so that's basically your cardiac output. And then you multiply cardiac output by vascular resistance, which is a measure of, you know, how much viscous resistance for, is, in your, is in your capillaries. Okay? And so the product of these two things, you know, gives you your um, gives you your mean arterial pressure, which is your MAP right here. Okay, so let me maximize this. It's kind of annoying. Okay, and so if you take the product of these, you know, that gives you your mean arterial pressure. Right? And so this is the same as you know our Ohm's law that we've seen from long term. So we, you know, we you've seen this before, but you know, um, this is kind of just as a primer because we're, we're going to talk about you know these different pressures and and different kinds of, of hypertension that people can experience. Okay, <clears throat> uh, and so the reason you know I, I bring that up again is because you know the principal fluid dynamic cause for hyper for hypertension really depends on your age, right? Uh, and so for young for you know for um, young adults and for kids that have high blood pressure, typically the form that it that it follows is what's called isolated systolic hypertension, right? And so that's kind of a fancy way of just saying that you know your diastolic pressure is 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 usually fine but your systolic pressure has gone way up. Okay? So that's why they call it isolated systolic hypertension. And so, you know, that's what you kind of see here. And so the graph, you know, starts at kind of the same place as kind of a normal blood pressure, but it goes much higher, right? Okay. And that's typically the, the kind of, um, you know, hypertension that's, um, that, you would, that you see um, in smaller and smaller kids. Okay? Whereas, you know, if you have hypertension as a middle-aged adult, what you have is mixed hypertension, which is both your systolic and diastolic pressure are raised. Okay? Um, and so that's kind of what you see right here. And so the, the reason for this is, you know, um, if you have high blood pressure as a, as a, you know, as a middle-aged adult, typically that's because your capillary bread has kind of, you know, narrowed. Um, and so that causes, you know, more blood pressure. Okay? Um, and then, you know, as you progress older, um, you know, for older adults like seniors, you know, typically the type of hypertension that you see is again, isolated systolic hypertension. Okay? Um, but it's due to a different reason. And so the reason, you know, older people have, you know, only isolated systolic hypertension is due to the fact that their blood vessels, you know, as they grow older have gotten stiffer. Right? And so we talked about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, as people age, their blood, their, uh, their blood vessels tend to stiffen. And so what, uh, and so when blood, um, your blood vessels stiffen, what that does is that it kind of amplifies the effects of weight propagation that you, that you experience, um, 
And so that ends up being just an isolated systolic hypertension in, in those cases. Okay, um, so any final questions on, on any of this before we, uh, we wrap up for today? I think I missed uh, when you said, or, or, or I, w I was just probably not paying attention. Uh, did you uh, did you say when uh, the cutoff was in this lecture? Uh, what was covered on the midterm? Yeah. So the, the cutoff was basically once I started these these lecture slides right here. So okay, that's what I thought. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So cardiovascular disease is a, is not going to be on the midterm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so there's no more questions. Uh, that's all. That's all that I have planned for today. And so on Thursday, you know, we'll continue these lecture slides. Um, and so you know, I'll try to get through them, but it's it's kind of a lot. And so we'll probably have to pick this up. Um, you know, um, actually a couple of weeks from now, because next week next week we have the midterm, and we have um, actually no, we'll we'll pick it up next week too. Okay. Um, and so you know, definitely you know, remember to vote in the poll, um, and definitely um, you know, pay attention and uh, keep watch for uh, for the sign up sheet that I'm going to send out um, basically right after this. Okay. Uh, for the final project. Okay. So Professor? We'll, yep, what's up? Uh, someone asked a question in the chat. Oh, let me see. Oh, so for younger adults, would it be examples of high stroke blind? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I forgot to I forgot to mention that. So yeah, the reason we have you see um, higher systolic blood pressure for, for younger adults um, is the fact that, um, you know, the, the reason that happens is, you know, for, for younger kids, you know, what can happen is that, you know, they, um, they have higher stroke volume. So what that means is that their blood, their heart is ejecting a ton of blood per heartbeat. And that blood, you know, is circulating all throughout their system. And so that kind of higher stroke volume is what is what causes this isolated systolic hypertension. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me know. Okay. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in today. You know, have a good evening. Um, you know, um, look out for the sign up sheet that I'm going to send out soon and I'll see you guys on, on Thursday. Professor, I actually uh, still do have a question. Um, yeah. What's up? When is the uh, cutoff date for when we would have to uh, choose the uh, model that we'll be using for the final project? Hmm. Um, uh, no cutoff date. Um, you know, I mean, definitely choose one definitely sooner than later so you can get working on it. But, um, but you know, if you want to take your time and kind of read the, the PDFs on there and, and, you know, and look, then, you know, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Um, just be aware that, you know, um, just be aware of that deadline on April 23rd. Um, okay. Which is going to be when the when the when the model is due, but um, you can you can choose you know you can take your time to choose your model if, if you want. Okay, and then I I might have missed it, but you mentioned something about a Google Doc. What was that for? Yeah, so the Google Doc is for uh, is is basically how you're going to sign up, and so I'm going to send basically a, a Google sheet uh, where you can basically put your name, which model that you're working on, um, basically so that I have all that information in one place, so I can I can send you the image data kind of directly for for that. Um, Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, have a good night. You too. Professor, I have a question, but it's on the uh, FBA cl uh, class. Yep. Sure. What's up? Uh, for the uh, homework uh, two, um, number uh, B, the explain the concept of symmetry and and the finite element problem. Yep. Um, I couldn't find the actual homework problem, the one before this. Um, that would display symmetry. I couldn't figure that one out. Yeah, so let me let me pull that up again. So it's the one that kind of looks like an upside down Y. And so like we okay, have- Yeah, I, I, that was my best guess for that one. But I yeah, yeah. I knew, yeah. I know how to, why, like how to apply the uh, the roller and why, but I didn't know for that one, how would we apply it though? Yeah, so for this one, actually, let me, let me pull up my iPad again. So I think it's easier to, to draw it. Let me stop this recording.